Welcome to this final recording on gravity and circular motion. This starts with some chats about Johannes Kepler and his three laws that he discovered, or I guess wrote down as he went through his studies of astronomy. So Johannes Kepler started off most of his career as a student underneath a gentleman named Tycho Brahe. Um, Tycho was a very famous astronomer that was one of the last what they call naked eye observers. He didn't use a telescope. And um, Tycho Brahe, by the way, is most famous for having the bridge of his nose sliced off and wearing a prosthetic brass or gold or copper uh, nose for the rest of his life. Uh, so Johannes Kepler came in as a student for Tycho Brahe, who had taken years and years and years of data. And Kepler looked at the data and found some interesting relationships in the data. Um, he found some patterns and some um, things that nobody else had seen in the data and from looking at that ended up publishing his three laws of planetary motion and so without further ado here are the three so kepler's first law has to do with the way that a planet orbits around the sun uh, now kepler noticed that as we were going around the sun um, now remember, this was Kepler was around the 1600s, 1640s or so. Um, so we had long since realized that we were not the center of our solar system, or maybe not long since, but recently uh, noted that we are not the center of our solar system. Uh, but it was still believed that the sun was at the center of our solar system, and that we were orbiting somewhere around like this. But, in fact, what Kepler was able to see with the data that he was taking based on, or the data that he had viewed, um, was that, in fact, it didn't make much sense for the Earth to be moving around the Sun in a circular orbit, because if it did, certain data points would have lined up better than they did. So, Kepler noticed that, in fact, the better model for how we moved around the Sun was an ellipse. And so, in double checking and triple checking his data for us and then double checking triple checking his data for other planets venus and mercury and mars and jupiter and saturn and everything uh, he noted that in fact rather than traveling in a circular path around the sun we traveled in an elliptical path around the sun and now that you would think that the sun would be in the center of this ellipse but in fact that's not where the sun is the sun is at one of the two focal points of the ellipse. So there's the sun at one side, and at the other side, there's actually nothing. So this is dead space. So the Earth travels along this path here, and it travels like this. So it goes around, and then it comes back, and it's farther away sometimes, and then it comes closer, and it gets very close. And so we can see that there's a couple of interesting things about this path. First, the average distance from the sun to the earth changes based on where we are uh, in the path. So if we have the earth at some later point in time here, this distance here is much shorter than this distance here. And so the closest location that we're at is very different than the farthest location that we're at. And in fact, we have special names for these farthest and closest locations. The farthest location is called the aphelion. And the closest location here is called the perihelion. And helion meaning to sun, um, so ap meaning farthest from sun, and peri meaning closest to sun. And so Kepler's first law then, as stated, is the following, that all planets follow an elliptical path with the sun at one foci, or I guess focus, at one focus. The two different points here, this one here and this one here, these are called the foci. Um, a single one of those is the focus. 
Um, and in fact, we can probably generalize this a little bit more. This is just for planets traveling around a sun. We can replace planets here with orbiting bodies. And we can replace the sun with the object it's orbiting. And that's Kepler's first law. Now, there's something that is important to understand about ellipses, and that is that a circle is actually just a type of ellipse. There is something called eccentricity of an ellipse that is an important property of the ellipse. And it has to do with looking at the length of these two segments here. So if we call this segment B and this segment A, then the closer those two values are to each other, A and B, the more circular we are, right? Because if we take a look over here, if I am a perfect circle, then these two labeled locations, A and B, would be exactly equal. They would each be a radius. So the more stretched out our ellipse is, right, the more off focus or off centered the ellipse is, the, the bigger the ratio is A to B or B to A, that means the more eccentric our orbit is. Um, and so we see then as A and B become disproportional, we end up having uh, different eccentricities of the, uh, the orbit. Um, Earth's orbit currently has a value, uh, an eccentricity value very close to zero. Um, so I guess actually it's not a ratio, it's a measure of one minus the ratio. Um, something along those lines. So Earth's eccentricity is very close to zero. Pluto's eccentricity, which is uh, considered to be the most eccentric, is about 0.25. Um, so the closer that value is to zero, the more circular the orbit is. So it makes sense that we couldn't necessarily see that we were in an elliptical orbit at first, because our orbit around the sun is actually quite circular. But it's not exactly circular. And that's what Kepler's first law says, that the orbits of orbiting bodies are all elliptical. Now Kepler's second law has to do with areas of the ellipse. So if our sun is here, let's imagine that the earth is connected to the sun with a line, a radial line we'll call it. Now what we find is that as the Earth gets closer to the Sun, the Earth actually travels faster. And that makes a little bit of sense because as this orbital radius gets smaller, the force of gravitational attraction is going to increase. And as the force of gravitational attraction increases, our acceleration increases, and as the acceleration increases, our velocity increases. So Kepler's second law says that if I take any two locations of the Earth, right here and here, say, and compare it to any two other locations of the Earth, say here and here, then if this time period here is the same as this time period here, right, so the time it takes to get from here over to here, if that's the same as the time it takes to get from here to here, say 30 days or something like that, then this area here, the green shaded area, those two areas must be equal. And it has to do with something called angular momentum. It, it has to do with the uh, um, product of, of the Earth's velocity and its radius. Um, so the smaller the radius is, the bigger the velocity must be. And the effect of this is that we must move faster over here in this area than we do over here in this area. So if this is 30 days, and this is 30 days, and this is 30 days, 
and this is 30 days. Well, I guess we won't say that these are 30 days. So let's let's actually say that maybe this is um, three days, right? And this is three days. We can see that if this takes the same amount of time, there's a much bigger linear distance to cover there than there is here. And so our velocity at the perihelion is bigger than our velocity at the aphelion. And Kepler's second law, as stated, is the following. A planet sweeps out with its radius line equal areas of its elliptical orbit in equal times. So if we know that it takes three days to travel this distance here, and we know that it takes three days to travel this distance here, then we know that the areas must be equal. And that leads us to understanding that this velocity here at the perihelion is much bigger than the velocity at the aphelion. Kepler's third law is a little bit on the mathematical side. And Kepler's third law has to do with Isaac Newton. Now, as, as we found, when we have an object in an orbit, orbiting bodies in circular paths, that is, we can say the following is true, that the centripetal force is equal to the gravitational force. So if we are in a circular path, we can say that the centripetal force then is caused by the gravitational force, because the only force that's pointing into the center of our circle is the gravitational force. It turns out that with, a, with, with actually no error whatsoever, we can have the same approximation for an elliptical orbit, because there will be certain times when our force is going to be greater than our centripetal force, when our gravitational force will be greater than our centripetal force, and certain times when it will be less than. So the, the net result is that it equals out. And we can say then that mv squared over r is equal to g, mass of the planet, mass of the sun, divided by the distance between them squared. Now, because we are averaging this out, this is going to be the average orbital radius and the average orbital radius here. I'm going to put that this is the mass of the planet, mass of the planet here, and mass of the sun here. And the first thing we see, of course, is that the mass of the planet cancels out. And the second thing we see is that the radius of orbit cancels out on one side with part of our radius of orbit on the other side. And Kepler's third law specifically has something to mention about radius and orbital period. Now, you may notice that in my equation here so far, I've got nothing having to do with orbital period. Well, orbital period will come from the fact that v is 2 pi times the orbital radius divided by the orbital period. So when I put that into this equation here, I've got 2 pi orbital radius divided by the period squared equals g times the mass of the sun divided by the orbital radius again. Rearranging a little bit, I'm going to bring my orbital radius over here. And then I'm going to bring all of this stuff, the 2 pi, over to this side on the bottom. Remember that I'm squaring 2 pi in our initial or I sorry, now our initial r orbit, uh, and dividing it by t squared. So the result is that when I do all of that, I get r orbit cubed on this side divided by t squared is equal to g times the mass of my sun divided by, remember I squared 2 and pi, so I've got 4 pi squared. And so take a look at this. That means this here, for every single planet in our solar system, is going to be constant. Because g is constant, it's, a, it's an orbital, it's a gravitational constant. The mass of the sun is constant for everything orbiting in our solar system. And 4 and pi are just values. So that means that we can say that for anything orbiting one object, this value, r orbit cubed divided by t squared, is equal to a constant. 
So if we were to take the orbital radius of Mercury and cube it and divide it by the orbital period of Mercury and square it, that would equal some number. If we were to take the orbital period of Earth and cube it and divide it by the orbital period of Earth and square it, we would get the exact same number. So for any two objects orbiting around the same thing, r1 cubed divided by r, sorry, divided by t1 squared is going to equal r2 cubed divided by t2 squared. So for every single planet around our sun and every single other thing, not just planets, but all of these asteroids and comets and everything, everything has the same ratio of orbital radius cubed to orbital period squared. And the effective use of this is that we can tell based on the orbital radius and orbital period of one thing orbiting something, we can tell what the orbital radius or orbital period is of something else, so long as we know what that something is. We'll do a whole bunch of practice problems about this in class, so please don't worry if this uh, is a little bit scary. I'll see you next time in class.